For tens of thousands of years, the Aborigines of the Sydney Basin had lived in its sandstone caves, carved by wind and water, eating bush foods and what they gleaned from the sea, always in perfect harmony with nature. When we white people came here, back only 200 years ago, which is only the blink of an eye, we found here the most incredible garden. A garden of sandstone, water, eucalyptus, and of course a culture here whose society was so finely tuned to the environment. Since that time, we have made many, many changes to this place. There's very few parts of that original garden that are left. The parts that we have used the sandstone and made our buildings therefore have become some of our most precious, uh, precious um, city um, heritage works. These buildings give us a link with our past, a visible and worthwhile history lesson. They're a discourse on the movement of power, money and status in Sydney, a kind of economic architecture. From the convicts, to the crown, to the church, to the government, to the merchant classes, and finally, to what was to become the multinationals. Observing Sydney's architecture is like reading the rock strata on which this city is built. The stone was the material that was used for the erection of prestige buildings. It was a symbol of, uh, it was a symbol of authority and opulence and progress. They remain in every society the significant rem reminders of our past and an association with what we once were. When you go to any city, it was once a colonial place, the most significant buildings there and the most attractive ones are usually the colonial buildings. You know, if you wanted to make a uh, statement, a status symbol or whatever you want to call it, you did it in stone because it had a feel of permanence. Sydney's heritage buildings are all different. Different architects, often working in competition with each other, and different builders have produced a series of distinctive buildings, all standing alone. All very special, and each a gem in their own right, but seldom in harmony with each other. Darlinghurst Jail is the exception. Here there is a uniformity because Captain George Barney, the designer, was an army officer, not an architect, so he was not out to make a bold statement. In 1822, the prison was out of the way and well apart from the city, a group of buildings that no respectable person was ever meant to see inside. Only the guilty stayed here. Originally, the jail was a walled square as shown in these plans by Henry Louis Bertrand. He was the prison artist and painted this watercolour while in jail. Henry, a Hunter Street dentist, murdered his bank manager, who had the misfortune to be the husband of Bertrand's mistress. Henry died in jail of natural causes aged 94. A life sentence in those days did mean life, or so the judges intended, but they failed to take into account the first prison governor. The, the governor himself, Henry Keck, was an incredibly corrupt governor. He was uh, governor for 30 years and uh, he had an orchestra that he used to rent out. They were originally um, the prisoners and he rented them out to the people in Sydney town for large amounts of money. He ran um, gambling rackets and he would take bribes for prisoners to go out on the town for the day. Uh, and uh, also he, um, he ran a brothel uh, in the women's cell block, which is um, over behind the uh, governor's residence. And and uh, for the male prisoners and uh, also when the business got brisk he also took the female prisoners in through the tunnel that's from the sculpture garden into the courthouse and used the courthouse as a brothel <laughs> as well so um, it was he was incredibly corrupt and uh, eventually was sacked in about 1849. While Keck was reaping his financial rewards, the jail and other colonial buildings continued to be built in stone as Sydney had unlimited stone. 
since not far from the town centre were the sandstone hills of Piermont. Here in the 1840s, an Englishman, Robert Saunders, started his quarry, which was known as Paradise. The site was open to the harbour winds, which blew away the heat and dust. Robert Saunders exported sandstone as ballast to Melbourne, San Francisco and New Zealand from his local Piermont wharfs. Sydney sandstone occurred naturally in much larger blocks. Now, the wharfs have been taken over by the Sydney fish markets. Fishing boats and pleasure craft tie up there, and some of the stones of the old wharfs are still visible. As building and brick became cheaper, stone lost its popularity, and the quarries were quickly built over. Such was the demand for solid level building land within a stone's throw of the city to satisfy the Federation housing boom. By the 1960s, many of Sydney's heritage buildings were showing their age and were becoming dangerous. George Proudman realised some stone needed to be replaced, but this presented an almost insurmountable problem. Sandstone varies in colour, and by using a stone from a different quarry, an ugly patchwork effect was occurring, which was spoiling the look of Sydney's beautiful heritage buildings. Conservationists were anxious to avoid this unsightly checkerboard effect, but the sandstone jail needed help. If you look at the nature of the sandstone itself, because it's very weak in tension, and when you get it into cliff faces, and when you get it under the pressure of wind and driving rain or crashing seas, it eats itself away from underneath that when we have used it in the making of the city, that where you get places where you get extreme vortexes and driving rain on our, some, our classic buildings, it gives us all these problems. I mean, Darlinghurst Jail is a perfect example of that. You know, we have the centre chapel and we have the radiating wings of the cells coming off it. No matter what direction the wind is coming from, it drives down those channels, turns and eddies, and eats away the sandstone in that centre chapel in the cornices. Updrafts were first noticed in Edinburgh when the wind lifted the kilts of the Scottish stonemasons, so they were ordered to wear tartan trousers. The problem of the different colours of sandstone was solved when George Proudman realised that a circular rock saw, designed as a less expensive way to cut out foundations for high-rise buildings, would free up a vast amount of large blocks of sandstone. Recently, deep foundations were needed in Piermont for tall buildings. So once again, stone became available from the Paradise Quarry. The use of these stone saws, heavy lifting cranes and big rigs made quarrying blocks of sandstone quicker, safer and easier. And one of the largest stones ever quarried, a 71 ton giant, was lifted out and taken to the domain to become a memorial for the State Emergency Services volunteers. 150 years ago, Robert Saunders could only rely on brute strength and muscle. To move the sandstone, he needed over 180 Clydesdale cart horses, since the larger blocks on specially designed carts were often pulled by teams of up to 26 horses. Robert Saunders was very particular about his horses. He had grown up amongst them back in Devon. His first task was to build stables and accommodation for his grooms in the middle of his quarry. The stables have gone, but parts of the groom's quarters remain, shortly to find a new lease of life as luxury apartments. As other high-rise buildings are developed, more sandstone from the Piermont quarries may be available. In 1872, a news item in the paper told of a traffic accident on the rough bush track of Harris Street, involving a stone for the new general post office. A 27-ton block of Piermont stone proved too heavy. The cart collapsed. Stonemasons were rushed to the site. They had to roughly dress the stone to make it lighter. Three days later, the stone could be lifted. The cart was repaired, the stone continued its journey and is still visible today.
none the worse for its tribulations. To split the stone, the masons would have drilled holes and hammered down wedges. This technique has been used since before the pyramids were built, and the drill holes are still visible on the face of many quarries all over the world. Only the drills have improved. Nowadays, large blocks of stone are worked at a factory before the finished stone is moved to the building site. Before space became so expensive, the blocks of stone were cut and carved at the roadside, constantly watched by a stream of passers-by. I uh, remember the apprentices particularly when they were being visited by uh, groups of schoolgirls from the senior years would comb their hair and brush themselves up. <laughs> they had a ball. To the average person, seen one block of stone, you've seen them all. But their lasting qualities, strength, etc., are all different. So now, before a batch of stone is selected, a geologist is employed. Now, sandstone varies widely in its strength, and because it's necessary that the sandstone we select for buildings is the most hard and durable sandstone possible, Today we scientifically test for sandstone and we do this by using thin wafers of stone like this which we put under a microscope. For instance, we know if there's a lot of clay in a sandstone it's less likely to last as long. When sandstone's first quarried, it's a light grey in colour, but after a few weeks or months the eye minerals in the stone literally rust and the stone turns a beautiful warm yellow brown in colour. Although the early masons knew little about geology, they knew their stone, and that some had very different qualities. A quarry in the rocks area of Sydney was known as purgatory. Sandstone from there is a rich and dark golden colour that the quarrymen called fool's gold, but not because of its colour. The masons found that there were hidden flaws in the stone, which were not evident when the stone was first quarried. Purgatory stone had to be left in the wind and rain for a few months until the cracks had appeared. And only then were able to decide how much of a large block could safely be used. The fact that it was termed gold showed that they realised the value of purgatory sandstone. The purgatory sandstone was recently quarried again to make space for the car park under a new Harry Seidler designed 60 storey building. To gain even more space, Sydney's first girls' school, soon to be a restaurant, was supported on steel beams, and more stone was removed from under it. Once again, purgatory stone can be used in preserving our heritage sandstone buildings. Um, this is the morgue that was built in 1870, uh, and it used to house the bodies after they'd been hanged, or people who died in the prison. Quite a few people did die here, um, and uh, a lot of people thought of it as a, as a place of purgatory, uh, as there are a lot of uh, deaths just from uh, um, the bad conditions here. The, the conditions were poor, the food was bad, uh, and the life prisoners had the, the, the worst time. Uh, anybody who uh, had a, a sentence for more than three years uh, was put in solitary confinement for nine months of the, of the beginning of their sentence and, uh, and they were only allowed out for an hour a day so it was really hard and they actually hated that. They, uh, they preferred flogging to being put in solitary confinement because it was over and done with quickly. <laughs> Captain Moonlight was one of the most famous ones, a bush ranger uh, who ended up being um, hanged here. Uh, there were 79 people hanged at this jail. There was a hangman here named um, Alexander Green who kept a lot of the uh, death masks himself.